Hello, everybody. Welcome to this Google Hangout from Sigma Xi, the Scientific Research Society. My name is Heather Thorstensen, and I'm the manager of communications for Sigma Xi. Today, we're going to be discussing tips on preparing for Sigma Xi's Student Research Showcase, which is a science communication competition that will be held on Sigma Xi's website March 28th to April 3rd this year, 2016. Our discussion today is going to be most helpful to people who are first-time judges as well as students who are thinking about participating in the competition because we're going to be discussing judges, judges' expectations and how the competition is run. And anyone who's watching can ask a question live if you'd like to by typing it into the right side of your screen and we'll get to those later on in the Hangout. The panel today has Sigma Xi members who have experience with judging this competition. We have Dr. David Compton, an associate professor in the Department of Physician Assistant Studies at Wingate University in Charlotte, North Carolina. And we have Dr. Shu Lu, an assistant professor of biology at the University of Finley in Finley, Ohio. We also have on the Hangout my colleague, Sigma Xi's manager of programs, Janelle Simmons, and she's the one who oversees the Student Research Showcase. So hi, everybody. Welcome to the Hangout. Hi. Hello. Hi. Let's start by discussing what the judges are hoping to see on the presentation websites. There are three main components here. And Janelle, could you explain what those three main components everybody should have on their presentation website? Yes. Well, there are three components. The first one is definitely the video. So with the video, it's about two to three minutes, and it serves as a means for the presenter to introduce themselves and to really introduce the research project to the judges and the guests that are visiting. And it's also an opportunity to show some enthusiasm for the project and let everyone know how excited you are to be conducting the research. And the best way to, to capture this video is by using, you know, it can be a, a cell phone, um, a good tablet. So you don't have to worry about using anything real elaborate. A cell phone or a tablet will work. And just want to make sure that with this video you are making sure you provide a statement as to how the research fits into the big picture. So that's the, the first component. Another component would be the abstract. So the abstract is 200 words max, which basically gives you an opportunity to discuss more information about your project. And it should talk about the hypothesis. So your state hypothesis statement should be in there. Of course, the formal title of your presentation and explanation, again, of how the research fits into the big picture and your description of your research methods and the desired results and also your findings and conclusions. And then the last part is your slideshow. So it's 27 slides maximum. Your first slide, of course, should be your introductory slide with the title and your name. And then your last slide should be your acknowledgment slide. And pretty much it's an opportunity to basically highlight your research as a slideshow. So of course you're going to discuss your project, you're going to mention your hypothesis, your hypothesis statement, your research question, your research goals, the technical description of your research methods and how they serve to test the hypothesis and your data and results and finally your findings and conclusions. So those are the three main components that will be judged during the Student Research Showcase. Thanks, Janelle. You went for all three. Okay. So let's go back to talking just about the video. For our two judges, I'd like to get some insight from you about when you're looking at the video, what are the basic things that you're hoping to see from the students? Well, I'll start off. Um, I think the big picture is a, is a main thing. Um, you know, for me, the thing that, that is important in the video also is where the source of the research came from. Um, you know, what did you see that made you want to do that research or what, you know, what your advisor told you that guided you for that research? Um, that kind of fits into the big picture and I'd, I'd really like to see that. That always makes it real interesting. Okay. Dr. Liu, did you have anything to add about yeah, that? I just want to add a little bit into it is that uh, make sure you clear what type of question you ask, but don't go into too technical detail. Uh, your video should be viewed by somebody without too much background in the research, okay? And 
make sure your result, what is your big result? If you have result, but again, don't go too technical, don't go too into too details. Okay. And so, Heather, can I, Heather, can I oh, mention sure. one thing about the video? The video really needs to be short. It should not be no more than two to three minutes. So I'm not sure if I mentioned that before. It has to be no more than two to three minutes because you'll have an opportunity in your slideshow and even in your abstract to really discuss really what you're doing. So no more than two to three minutes. Okay, so short, big picture, not too technical. Let's talk about things you shouldn't be doing in your video um, as far as like if have there been any mistakes that you've seen students make in the past that you would steer students for this year's showcase away from? Uh, I think before I noticed some students talk very fast in the video and you might not want to do that. I know there might be a time limit and you try to put as much information as possible into it. It might not be a good decision. And sometimes it may be because the student was nervous, okay? So practice and practice more so you will be more comfortable and record the video, record a very good one. And that is one thing I noticed. Also, I noticed is that um, sometimes the background of the video doesn't look very good, okay? So students may want to get advice from other people whether this is a good one or not. And Try to you know make it better, improve the quality of the videos, etc. And those would be something I've seen before in my advice. I would think. Okay, so take your time. If you talk too fast, it's okay to re-record and think about where you're shooting and just try to make it look pleasing. Okay. Also, one thing to keep in mind is you want to be creative with the video. You know, you can definitely be at your research site or at your lab. You know you know, recording the video, so you don't necessarily have to think, you just have to sit down at your, you know, laptop or your phone or your tablet and record the video. Find creative ways in those three, two to three minutes to introduce yourself and show your enthusiasm for the project. That's a great idea. I think one of our, I know one of our winners from last year, the undergraduate winner, he shot some of his video in his lab and it gave it a kind of a behind the scenes feel. I think so, and, and I think you know, the, the point about practicing, you've got to relax. And the one thing that I think is if the person looks like they're reading something off of the script, then it's it kind of looks like it was put together at the last minute. So take a, a day or so and make sure you've gone through your, your script that, you know, and cover the things you're going to cover in your key points. But just really practice so that it's smooth and, you know, that you don't have a chance to... Um, stumble as you're, you're making your video. Okay. Now that we've talked about the don'ts of the video, let's move to the more positive do's of the video, which are things that have impressed our judges panel in the past. What has impressed you guys before? Well, I think, you know, I, I think the, the part for us where, where we're receiving the information from the student about the big picture and uh, a little bit about themselves and their their institution where they're doing the research. That's a, that's a major piece, and how that's presented does make a difference to us. Uh, you know, as as with anything, if you're applying for a grant, how you present that information in a grant makes a difference. So for us, it it needs to be very clear, and um, the person really needs to come across as though they really believe in what they're doing and they're really excited about what they're doing. I think that helps. Yes, uh, some of the excitement is something I want to see also. That really shows that you actually love science. And to do science, you have to love science, as a matter of fact, because as most students already notice, it is not easy. Okay, if you don't like it, you're not going to continue doing that later on. So please show us some excitement. Uh, at the same time, you know, uh, dress professionally in the video because I actually think some people did not dress very professionally before and that's not a very good thing to do. Uh, another one is that nowadays camera looks really good so you can take a good quality video but keep in mind the voice is also important. It might be noisy somewhere so when you uh, take the recording make sure you go to a quiet location. If you have a recording studio, many university or maybe high school have that. That might be helpful as a matter of fact. 
Okay, Dr. Lou, that brings me to my next question. You mentioned a recording studio. I wonder what other resources students might have to help them in their videos that you might be able to point out to them, like Janelle was saying, you could use your iPad or your, your camera phone, um, the camera on your phone to take the video. For somebody who doesn't have any experience with making videos, what kind of help might they be able to find? One thing that I think would, would help them a lot would be to uh, re record what they think they would like to have and then have someone else, you know, one of their friends, look at it and tell them whether or not it, it looks authentic and it's, it looks like they're really um, enthusiastic about what they're trying to do. And, and do that a couple of times and maybe in a couple of different situations where they could um, have a different background or something along those lines. And then ask the person, you know, which one looks the best. And once they get that from the students, then perhaps they could ask their, their faculty advisor about the same thing. Many, many schools have, as you know, as was mentioned before, many schools do have a video um, studio, but if they don't have a video studio, you know, just practicing on their uh, laptop or their iPad or something like that over and over again really does make a difference. Yeah. yeah. Uh, asking some people to look at it is a very good advice. As a matter of fact, my old advice would be for that, ask your grandmother to look at it. You know, somebody has very little background in your research. Somebody may not even uh, went to college to look at that because the video is supposedly to be, you know, simple and some people without background should be able to understand it. And if she said, yes, I know what you are doing, it looks great, then it probably is great. That's good great advice. advice, yeah, to get people who are meant for the video to look at it and give you feedback. And also, I wanted to also point out that we have all the videos from last year on the website, and you can go and look at them on the Student Research Showcase website and just peruse the videos from previous years and get ideas and see what they did and how they recorded it. That will give you some really good ideas, too. Okay, is there anything else anybody wanted to say about the video before we start talking about the abstracts? Are we okay to move on to abstracts? Yes. Okay. So, um, Janelle, could you talk a little bit again about the abstract and what we're looking for there? Sure. Well, the length is no more than 200 words, so the maximum must be 200 words. If you go a little under, that's fine, but you cannot go over 200 words. And the abstract must include the formal title of the research project. It also should have your statement of, statement of hypothesis, your research questions, and your research goals. And then explain how the research fits into the big picture picture, a description of the research methods, the anticipated results, and your findings or conclusions. So that is the next major part of the presentation is that abstract. That sounds like a lot for 200 words. Does our, <laughs> does our judges panel have any advice about how to fit all that in in 200 words? It's very hard to do that, but, but that's about the number, 150 to 250 words is about the number of words that you're allowed in a professional publication for the abstract. So you have to have all that information in your abstract as well for, for those publications. So one thing they could do is, is just take a look at um, if they have access to a, a, a science journal and just kind of look at the science journal and even if they don't understand everything that's in the abstract, it'll give them a good idea of kind of how people uh, shorten sentences so that it all fits in. Mm -hmm. And one thing I want to also mention is that there's, there may be some complex formulas that cannot be articulated as text, so you are able to use that as part of your abstract, but it should be primarily text. Okay. And then I know that something that some students have worried about in the past with the showcase is if they should enter the competition if they don't have any results, and how do they handle that in their abstract if they don't have any results yet to put in? What would you guys well, say to that? I think that is okay, as a matter of fact. Uh, honestly, if you uh, go to many professional scientific conferences, some of the presentations do not have the final result either. Okay, so it, it is actually okay. Just show us, you know, what you have done. Of course, starting with the hypothesis, your methods, and how your method may help, you know, test your hypothesis, and tell us what you have, and that should be 
good enough in, in this case. We just want to see you, know, you have done something and you make progress. Maybe next year you can show us a, a better one, but you know this year you, you have what you have. And uh, don't be afraid to uh, join the competition. Okay, it's, it is an experience for you as a matter of fact, and we'd like to see that. Part of it is to see that you actually love science, and that's the most important part, I think. Mm -hmm. I agree 100%. That, that's, that's a great summary of, of why they should go ahead and participate. Um, who knows, by the time they actually get to the final submission, you know, they, they may have more to present, but um, don't hold back. Okay. And so thinking about the three elements of this competition, you have your video, you have your abstract, and you have your technical slideshow. The video, as we said, is for a more general audience. The abstract is somewhere in the middle. And so when we say for the video, get feedback, show it to your grandmother, show it to someone who doesn't have a science background, who might be somebody that they can take their abstract to for feedback to find out if it's too technical? You know, probably their advisor would would give them a, a really good um, review of the abstract and maybe and maybe say you know you can leave this part out uh, because it is very technical and, and it's it's not going to match um, and that's assuming that they also take with them uh, any instructions they have about the abstract that so that the advisor will know what's expected okay or maybe ask their friends, their classmates, because they have some knowledge about, you know, right. the scientific part of the research. And if uh, the friends and classmates say, yeah, I understand what's going on, then maybe that should be okay. Yeah. <coughs> okay, that's good. So let's talk about the do's and don'ts again. So the, what would be some don'ts for an abstract, or what has not impressed you in the past with students who have turned in abstracts? You know, I, I guess the thing that I'm always looking for, and it's not something I've seen, but the thing I'm always looking for in an abstract is whether or not someone has actually um, not really overstated what their what their findings are and, and what they expect to come out, but, you know, they're, they're stating it as if it's a foregone gone conclusion. You know, we... we we sh will find this because this is the way it is. So remember that until you've got your results, um, anything can happen, and science is, you know, science is based on fact. And so we, we don't really want to influence how we write uh, based on how we feel things should come out, or even if we are 99% sure that it's going to come out a certain way, we shouldn't um, go ahead and put that into the, into the abstract until we have it in our hands. Yeah, excellent point. Dr. Liu, did you have anything to add about that? Uh, we talked about the technical details uh, just now, and sometimes I do see some with a lot of technical details, and I think, you know, try to avoid that as a matter of fact. Uh, personally, I do not want to see an extra with reference, actually. You know, many journal actually would not allow that as a matter of fact. So if you think, I need to put a reference onto an abstract, that might be a little bit too difficult, uh, technical too. Okay, so avoid the references. Okay, let's talk about the positive things with abstracts. When is it that you read an abstract and you think, wow, that's a great abstract? What elements does it have that, that does it for you? Uh, if I see a very smooth logical flow of information, I really feel very comfortable about that. I know, oh, this is a hypothesis, this is a method, and this is the result. You know, I always feel, oh, this is a very great one. Honestly, it's not easy to say, you know, how, what's the quality of a good abstract at this point. But when I see it, I can tell, you know, if there's a good flow of information, I, I think that's a good one. Yeah. Now, sometimes, because it's 200 words, and some people really want to cram too much information into it, and you look at the abstract, it looks like pieces here and there. That's something we should avoid, actually. Okay. Yeah, I like to see the, the methods being um, not exactly methods that are listed in, but we put the facts in, but we also have, uh, with this, we will have a um, kind of a little lead-in or a description of uh, what we're trying to accomplish with that method. Now, I've seen a lot of abstracts where they just have numbers and, and um, maybe just a few words in between the numbers and the, and the percentages and stuff. 
and we really need more of it, more of that, um, more explanation. Okay. All right, so let's move on to talking about the third final major component of the presentation websites for the Student Research Showcase, which is the technical slideshow. And um, Janelle, could you give us a couple points about that real quick, just so that we are uh, reminded about what that should be? Sure. So it's a reminder is that you must have no more than 27 slides. 25 of them are your content. Your first slide should be your title slide. Your last slide should be your acknowledgement slide. And again, you want the formal title, statement of hypothesis, so your research questions, the hypothesis statement, your description of your research methods, your data, your results, and your finding and conclusions. Now, one thing I do want to mention is that there may be some research that has to be private just because it has not been published yet or you're, you're waiting to you know get you know final approvals and such and such so there is a way to still participate if you must have that research private and basically what you can do is create a secondary site which is password protected and you would need to give myself the password so that I can then give it to the judges assigned to the presentation Okay, so just because your research isn't published, don't think you can't participate. You can always set up that password-protected website. Yes, absolutely, and it's just make sure that I receive the password so that I can give it to the judges to look at the presentation. Okay. So as far as the slideshow goes, where does this end up on our sliding scale as far as who people should keep in mind as far as who their audience is for this slideshow? The judges. So this point is it's primarily for the judges with a technical background in that area of study. Okay. So for the judges panel with Dr. Compton and Dr. Liu, who would be like a, a practical person that they could go to for feedback while they're preparing the slideshow to see if it's, if it's the right level of um, technical information? I think a combination of their peers and also the um, the person advising the research would give would give a, a really nice um, idea of whether it's technical enough or not. But the other thing is is that if their peers look at it and they're approached with the the question of have I left anything out? Is this is this everything that needs to be there? Um, a lot of times they they can point out you know. It, I don't understand this. Can you can you give us you know can you say a little bit more about it or something like that? So I think involving their peers is a real big part. Okay. Yeah. I think that's a great point. Uh, as a matter of fact, you know, don't just ask the graduate advisor. Ask some people in the same department. Okay. Uh, judge like us who probably not exactly in the area of your research. Okay. So we, we do not know as much as your graduate advisor usually. So you want to find some people that are similar to us. If they can understand, know your research, understand the technical detail, then we probably could. If you could not, then you might actually have to make it easier for us to understand, actually. Okay. So the slideshow is a little bit um, of a unique point to this competition because the best practices that people always hear for PowerPoint presentations and those kind of things is don't put too much text on the screen. But in this case, you're not going to be able to actually be presenting and talking to the slideshow. It's just going to be the text. So how does that best practice come into play? Should students be putting a lot of text on these slides or should they be using more visuals? What do you think is the right balance there? Uh, I think they need to mix uh, diagrams presentation with text. Still, you don't want to avoid uh, too many words. Although we can read, and it's kind of different from a real uh, PowerPoint presentation, but still, if you make the slide very crowded, it's not easy to read as a matter of fact. So you still want to avoid that. Uh, use bullet points. That might be easier if you really need to put too many words onto a slide. Yeah. And you are, oh, I'm sorry, go ahead. No. Well, I was just going to say it, it makes it makes a diagram a lot easier if you can put a few bullet points underneath the diagram, um, pointing pointing out why it's important, and I think that really gets the point across to us real well. 
and I was going to mention that you know you can use some video as long as it's not um, taking over the entire slideshow and there are many slide hosting sites which allow you to embed animation and videos into your PowerPoint. Okay, so that would help as well to help explain things. So uh, what kind of elements have you seen work well in the past with these slideshows, Dr. Compton and Dr. Liu? I was trying to think back to last year. Um, describe what you what you're looking for with elements. So are you is there certain things in the slideshow that would make something more successful than another slideshow? Um, is it the way that the slides are talking or the level of technicality is the best? Is it that you like a balance between non-text and text? Um, what can students do to be successful with the slideshow? I think a, I think a balance of, of uh, non-text and text is, is real important. I also, and, and this is this is a kind of a, a thing that, that I look for is I also like to see a summary either in the, in the format of restating okay this is what we were trying to do and this is what we've done so far or in, a, in the format of a, of a flowchart that says this is where we are and this is the process we're going through and this is what we've accomplished so far and that really pulls it all together and you, you walk away from that slideshow saying I understand what they were trying to do, I understand where they're, they're issues are and this was great. Yeah, I think I agree. And if you have a lot of data, maybe you have some small summary in between, it would be helpful actually. Otherwise, when we get to the end, with so much data, we may get lost. Okay, so avoid just lots of data without any kind of explanation. Avoid the diagrams without any kind of explanation. And then um, use bullet points to help or flow charts to help get your points across. Yes. Is there anything um, that students should be avoiding in the slideshow besides putting too much text on the slides? You know, folks tend to believe that if they put a lot of animations in, that that helps their slideshow, or if they use multiple colors on the screen and uh, things like that, I think if you're going to put text in, go ahead and make it black, you know, black text on a white background if if that's what you're using, or or some highly contrasting color. And then, in the, as far as animations go, animations and um, things like that are are okay, but we tend to only have them in a um, you know, in, in one place on the slide or something like that, if it's going to be something that really gets across to everyone else. So I would say really restrict the use of animations unless it's pertinent to what you're trying to depict. Um, if you want to depict the biological process and you've got a clear flow that you would like to animate so that things pop up, that's one thing. But just to animate the words coming up or, or something like that, it, that's, it, it takes away from the presentation. Yeah. And I agree. Uh, the background, white background actually works really well. Don't make it too colorful. may not be very easy to read. Um, so at the same time, uh, pull through your PowerPoint many times because I quite often see typos, and that's not a very good thing for sure. Yeah, keep it professional, avoid the typos, and avoid the, the extra animations that don't need to be there. Okay, so now that we've talked about the three main components, the video, the abstract, the slideshow, there's a couple other things that need to be on your website, which is your um, presentation title and your presenter information. So for all three of you, I wanted to first start by asking what helps in terms of a presentation title? Hmm. Well, I think creativity is a must, but also you want to be concise and to the point with your title. Yeah. Yeah, I think, you know, it, it, in many cases, people try to put a hook into their, their title and, and have something that um, is a little bit n not related directly to what they're, they're trying to present just to get somebody's attention so they'll, they'll come over and look. And that's, that's not a bad thing on a po poster presentation where people are walking by and things, but we're going to be focused 100% on, on your slideshows. 
and so we we really you know very uh, to the point uh, succinct titles I, I think are great okay and then what about the presenter information this is like a sentence about the presenter um, themselves what kind of information should be going in that section should be their name of course their institution you know whether they're a high school student uh, undergraduate student or a, a graduate student so that information is important and the institution name and the field of study would also be great as well for that um, presentation information okay I also saw um, somebody last year who put in that they were looking for a job at a lab is that something that you would recommend Oh, for the presentation information? Yeah, it was for presenter information. He was like, and by the way, I could be, in, I'd love to work in your lab or something. <laughs> I probably wouldn't add that um, <laughs> to the presentation information. <laughs> okay. Um, let's move on to talking about what happens during the judging period. So, uh, of all the presenters submit their presentations by March 21st. We're going to be putting them on Sigma's Eyes website and then starting March 28th to April 3rd we have our judging period where the judge judges are all looking at the presentation websites online and they interact with students by writing questions and comments on their website. So Janelle, this question is for you. After the presentation websites are available, how are the judges assigned presentations to evaluate? Well, basically, when the student and the, the you know the the participant signs up for the student research conference, the student research showcase, we're given their area of interest, their field of study. So all of the judges, when they specify that they are going to participate as a judge, they let us know their field of research, and then we match the students field of research with the judges field of research. Judges receive no more than 10 presentations. Sometimes it's less depending on how many we have received in that field of research and they're given about a week to go through judge and at their own leisure. So there's no particular time frame during that week to judge. They can do it at any time as long as they're finished by the deadline which is March, not March, April 3rd. So we just, you know, that's how I will assign each of the participants of the showcase will receive a registration ID and that's how the judges will receive the information based on the registration ID and also the field of study. Okay. So for Dr. Compton and Dr. Liu, in the past when you've been given your presentation websites and you've gone to look at them, what types of comments or questions have you left on the student presentation websites? Uh, if there was something I do not understand, I will ask. So quite often I uh, ask students to clarify some of the results on some of the methods. Yeah. And why you think the data is really what you think it is, how how the interpretation go with the data, etc. Mostly our technical detail I will ask. Yeah, I think I, I stick to the technical details also. However, there there sometimes are um, you know, just out of curiosity, you want to ask you know, have you thought about such and such, or and and put that in? But it, it's really the, the main thing is to we tend to ask, or at least I tend to ask, about things to make it clear and and get get all the information clear because we all write differently, um, and so something may be said, and I, I am thinking it's going one way, and the you know it's not. So we we tend to ask. One thing I would say about the the questions that we ask. The sooner you can answer the question, the better off you are. Um, I've had students who answered it within, you know, a couple of hours of the time that I, I put it up. I've also had students that waited until the very end of the judging period and then answered all the questions from everyone. And that really limits our ability to, you know, say things about the presentation. Okay, so timeliness is very important for presenters as far as getting back to the judges. Right. Because we, we sometimes will have a follow-up question, you know, and, and that's follow-up questions are, are generally good things. And so you want to leave yourself time to have that. Okay. And sometimes we may have some other activity on the day of the deadline. We might have to finish earlier. So if you decided to answer really late, we may already submit the results. 
Mm, that's okay. That's a good point too. Don't want to don't want to hold back the judges. So when you guys have judged in the past, how much time do you spend typically looking at each presentation website and and in other words, how long do these students have to grab your attention? It's a, you know, that's a, a tough question. I, I'm just thinking that, you know, sometimes, sometimes 20 or 30 minutes um, is is used. Um, sometimes I will look at things and then kind of go away and think about it and come back um, because we have had some very complex things pre presented, and I want to make sure that I, I've thought through everything they're talking about. So it, it's it's variable. I would say that even though you're limited on the slides and you're limited on the on the video and the abstract we're not going to spend a limited amount of time um, unless everything's blank then that that would be an easy one to judge but um, we haven't seen those so far yeah I think it really depends on how much I know the subject area although you know I am supposed to be in the general area but sometimes in a small area I do not know then I will spend a lot more time on it so some of them maybe 15 minutes, some of them maybe 45 minutes. It really depends on how it looks like. Wow, okay. So it's a pretty big time commitment for these volunteer judges, so it's really great that so many people do that and sign up to volunteer. We really appreciate that. So I also wanted to ask you what students should be doing during this judging period um, besides trying to answer judges' questions as timely as possible. Is there anything else that they could be doing during that time? One thing that I think that they could be doing was checking out other um, other student websites because those are going to be public and you can maybe see what the other ones are in your category, even outside of your category. And I also think that you know you can't just because you've submitted, you can't stop thinking about the materials you've submitted. You have to you know continue to um, analyze and, and try to figure out you know what could be asked. Or perhaps one of your peers might come up and say, "Hey, did did you tell them about such and such?" And then just be be ready if a question arises to include that information because it's it, you know science never ends. Yeah, that's true. Anticipating questions is a big idea. Okay. Um, is there anything that you're hoping to see in your interactions with the students as they're answering the questions from you that could help them have a more successful presentation or have more uh, positive evaluations? You know, I'm thinking that, you know, short answers are great, but if it's a short answer, it would be nice to have an explanation of why that's the answer. And I guess that depends on the question that's asked. But if, if we ask, you know, did you look at such and such, and you have an answer for that, yes or no, but it would be nice to say, instead of just saying, no, we did not assess that during our study, why, why was that not assessed during your study? Or, you know, maybe it's outside the scope of what you were allowed to do. Just something like that would, would really help a lot. And it kind of personalizes the response to the questions. Okay. Hey, if you answer yes, you know, tell us maybe your result, how the result look like, and whether the data and agree with your interpretation or not, etc. Or maybe you can open a new job or a new research. You know, tell us those type of information. Right. Okay. All right. So we've gotten through the main uh, subject points of this hangout as far as. Um, what the judges are looking for in presentation websites and also what happens during the judging period. So we're going to open it up to any questions from the audience. If you're watching live, you can ask a question by typing it into the right side of the screen now and we'll um, talk, with it, talk about it with the panelists. And in the meantime, I'll keep asking questions. So <laughs> just until those come in. Um, so this is a science communication communication competition for students, but for the judges on our panel today, I wanted to ask about how you've used science communication in your professional careers and why it's important. So could you give an example of how you've had to adjust the way that you've talked to different audiences about your science like we're asking students to do in this competition? 
Well, I, you know, for me, for me in making presentations, um, the audiences can be varied uh, and, at, and at different levels of, of knowledge, but I, I, I tend to think of it as uh, when I'm teaching, I teach a three semester course. And when the students come into that course, they have, uh, you know, maybe a small amount of, of background knowledge. And so I have to adjust the materials, which are, you know, are technical, to that and de deliver those things um, at the level that I think they're, they're there. So, you know, for the average person making a presentation, we have to know our audience. And I think the students, you know, have to know that we're, you know who we are and what what kind of ideas we have. Dr. Liu, what about you with your uh, professional experience with science communication? Uh, I think you basically look at the audience interest. If they totally do not understand, they probably do not have a whole lot of interest. My advisor actually advised me in this way. There are three different ways you do your presentation. One of them is you talk about it in 30 seconds. And people say, okay, I get your idea, so tell me more. Tell them in five minutes. Okay? And then they have so great interest, then you talk forever. So that's more or less how you adjust. You, you tell them from a less detail to more detail, and then see what that response is. But for some people, you do not really know, you do not, you could not judge on that. You, you don't know how much you need to talk, actually. And that's maybe some other, you know. Adjustment I would do. Okay, so kind of like this this competition where you have your short video and your abstract, it gets more and more deep and deeper into the rabbit hole of the details. Okay, and so we've heard about how much the judges spend time-wise of their own personal time volunteering to look at these presentation websites, and it's a big time commitment um, for our judges. So I was wondering what it is that you hope that students take away from this competition. I think if, if, if they find it fun, that's a great thing because they'll keep doing this over and over again. But I think also to find out that um, this is a non-confrontational event. Our, we have as much interest in, in the quality of the work that they put in as in giving them our assessments and advice and, and maybe sharing some knowledge with them about their their. Um, projects that they're they're presenting, so I, I would really like for them to know that not everyone is out to give them a, a bad grade. So. Yeah, and I think I also would like them to use this opportunity to improve their communication skills. So we talk about communication just now. Mm -hmm. If you do great science, you do not know how to present your data. It's not very helpful, honestly, because people do not know what you have done. In science, communication is actually very important. I, I want them to improve that uh, ability and things and experience. Mm -hmm. Okay. And as far as the time period where judges and students are interacting during the judging period, um, it, it sometimes messages can be hard to understand or not clear when you're just talking over written word and comments. And so I wonder what your advice is for presenters if they come across a judge's comment that they don't understand or if they don't agree with the comment, um, what's the best way for them to respond? I think just just asking for clarification or, or stating that you you know that you don't know or you don't understand um, I think those of us who who have been doing this for a while know that it, it really doesn't hurt to say that you don't know something um, when it when you say that what it really means is but I will know it tomorrow and so I think that the students you know should should carry that same thought is that if if they aren't clear on what we're asking, go ahead and ask. It's not going to count against them, and it may lead them to learn something that they can really use. Yeah, I agree. Don't be defensive. You know, we're trying to help you. We're trying to make you love science even more. We're not really trying to give you a bad grade or trying to make your life any harder. True. Yeah. 
Okay. And then we talked also about how students do not necessarily have to have results to be in this competition. So something that presenters might be wondering is how far along should they be with their research project before they sign up? Do you recommend that they be at a certain phase or um, is just at the beginning okay? Janelle, this might be a more appropriate question for you. Oh, okay, gotcha. Well, I think that you need to be able to participate in all three major parts of the presentation. So you need to be far along to be able to stage a hypothesis, your research methods, your anticipated results to, to the audience. So if, if you're able to get to that point, that it would be um, perfectly acceptable. Okay, sounds good. And then to go along with that, when students are coming into this competition, they're putting all this work into it, um, they get some evaluations from judges, what kind of feedback do they actually get from the judges? Are they getting written comments from everybody or just for evaluation forms? They're actually receiving, you know, feedback, written feedback, and some scoring to really help the, the the student with their research, with their project. Because I'm sure the student research showcase is not the only place that they will be presenting this information. So this will really help them as they continue with the research if they are not completed with the process, and also to be able to communicate their work in other venues, such as a poster session at conferences and maybe even a future publication. Yeah, I agree. Uh, I quite often will give suggestions how to improve the quality of the presentation. It doesn't mean your presentation is bad. Quite often I say it is excellent, but I will have some suggestions in this, and I do mean it genuinely from my mind as well. So uh, the purpose of doing that is really to improve your presentation in the future, because you may actually present it in a scientific conference. You may write up a paper and submit to a journal article. And I hope that will help your future career. So just take it. And if you agree with me, uh, just incorporate those suggestions into your presentation. And you don't need to agree with me all the time. <laughs> OK. And then let's also talk about uh, the prizes for this showcase. Janelle, could you explain what um, students who rank at the top will get for prizes? Sure. So we have different levels of prizes. So of course there will be one overall winner for the high school division, the undergraduate division, and the graduate student division. And then we'll also have winners in the different fields of interest. Now one of the things that we're doing this year that's brand new is we're doing a People's Choice Award. So this is where we're going to be asking those who are participating in the showcase to look at those other presentations and choose which one you feel is, is the best and there will be a $250 prize that goes to that person. Now the overall winners for the undergraduate, graduate, and high school, they receive a prize of up to $500 and everyone receives a certificate of participation. Okay, that sounds good and so maybe that's something that while the judging period is going on and students are waiting for their judges' comments and questions, they can be going and looking for the People's Choice Award winner. Correct. Okay, great. And so also uh, we're coming to the end of the questions that we have, that I have prepared, and I don't see that we have any audience questions, so this will be the wrap-up question. Um, Janelle, could you explain how people can get started as far as when they need to register by and how much it costs to participate? Sure. So. If you're interested in applying, you need to send your program abstract for pre-approval because we want to make sure that what you're putting out there is indeed research. So you want to send an email to meetings at sigmazi.org, again meetings at sigmazi.org with your abstract, your project description. Then once approved, you will receive an email with additional information as to how to register. You'll also receive your registration ID. Sigma Xi members pay $35 to participate. Non-Sigma Xi members and those with lapsed memberships pay $50. Now we do have high school students and we, you know, if you're a group of high school students from a particular school, we have group rates available for those high school students. So if any questions about that, you can just contact me 
and then what will happen is that once you've registered, you will then be able to go online and submit your presentation. The deadline to submit your presentation is March 21st. And what I will do is, once it's been uploaded, I will take a look at them and just make sure everything is OK. If I see there's something missing or there's something that's not loading properly, I will send you an email prior to the published date of the 25th. So all presentations will be published for judging to begin you know, by the 25th, but judging won't officially start until the 28th, and that's only because it's Easter weekend. So we're not expecting anyone to really, you know, go ahead and start judging Easter weekend, but we want to make sure that we have the presentations up and available on the 25th of March. So asking those participants, please just check your emails just to make sure that everything is good to go because I will be reviewing them to make sure that they are viewable to the judges and the public that will be looking at the presentations. Great, okay. And so um, if there's no other questions, I just want to say that if you'd like more information about the Student Research Showcase, you can go to SigmaZi's website at sigmazi.org and look under the Meetings and Events section. And that's also the section where you can go if you would like to sign up as a judge. There's a volunteer form in that section as well. And I also wanted to mention, Heather, that for those of you who've never done something of this magnitude, there are some free resources available. You don't have to use them, but there are a few. One of them, of course, is Tumblr. And we actually have on our Student Research Showcase site a sample presentation in Tumblr. So just make sure you t um, pay attention to that to see exactly how a presentation looks like, what it's supposed to look like, in addition to looking at presentations from last year. You could also use um, YouTube to assist you as well for your resources. SlideShare, which is a slide hosting site if you want to embed videos into your, your slideshow. And also Discus. And Discus would be what you use to um, create that, that comment system so that the judges were, are able to put comments on your presentation. So you know those are some, some easy and quick resources. And also, we do have on our Student Research Showcase website a judge's guide. So anyone who's interested in judging and just not sure what to do, you'll be able to download the judge's guide. And also, we have a student guide. So for students wanting to know more information about the showcase and everything we discussed today is also available for download as well on our website. OK, great. And Dr. Compton and Dr. Liu, did you have any closing thoughts that you wanted to share? Uh, I would like to suggest students look at their uh, all three components on different computers, different browsers, make sure they are available. You know, I think in previous year, at least one student presentation it did not show up at all in any system, as a matter of fact. And then, you know, I command on doing saying, hey, I do not, could not see anything, but there was no response. I do not know whether students actually kind of decided to quit or uh, it was something else. So make sure it show up in every system. I know Janelle says she will check it for you, but she probably will not check it on multiple computers and multiple browsers. What? And that should be a student's responsibility. I'm good. How are you? Yep. Excellent point. Dr. Compton, did you have any closing thoughts? I no, I agree. I think you know just you know kind of testing what you're doing. Um, Making sure that your your browser is going to accept your video and that the format of the video matches. And I don't know if if uh, Janelle, do you give a guidance on the format of the video for folks? Yes, that's actually in the student's guide. That's that's on the website. So that would be that would be something to absolutely make sure you can do because I too had a video that didn't show up, and I had an abstract, and I had slides, but I had nothing to introduce me to the person, and I, I guess it was because the video was not in the right format. Right. Okay. All right. Well, thank you again to Dr. Compton and Dr. Liu and Janelle. Um, we hope that everybody considers participating in the showcase, and we hope that everybody has a great showcase this year. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Good luck. Thank you. All right.